ask you to draw me a picture of God. What would you draw? Any ideas about what you draw? You can't? You say you can't draw a picture, a picture of God. Okay, well most of us could draw a picture of Jesus, right? And many artists out there who have drawn Jesus aren't really very accurate in skin tone, but you know, we've got some ideas or some mental images of what Jesus looks like through historical stories and scrolls that have been found and, you know, oral history. We do have some ideas of what Jesus possibly looked like. You know, in Israel, the tomb where they think Jesus was buried measured six feet. I think I talked about this before, but it measured six feet. And each um, slab, each bed in the tomb me measured six feet. But the one that they thought that was of Jesus's, they had to dig out six inches more. So historians think that Jesus was quite a tall man. So we can draw those type of pictures, but most of us have no idea how to call, how to uh, draw God. Would you draw God as a man? Would you draw God as just light? Would you draw God as a woman? No, just as light, huh? Big light, okay. We know that God is not a person. We know that God is a spirit. And it's hard to know how to draw God because God is not a person. You know, at Princeton Seminary, they're not, the students are not allowed to use the pronoun he or himself. They're not permitted to do that in the seminary when they're writing there or speaking either way. They must say God or they must say God self. They can't use the terminology he or himself. That's absolutely not allowed because God is neither male nor female, God is spirit. And that's a good practice because it reminds us that God truly is spirit instead of our tendency to imagine God is male. Some people imagine that Jesus, or some people to draw Jesus as just a very loving, gentle, forgiving person, and they, got, they, they portray God as legalistic and angry and unforgiving and judgmental. I think we've got some pictures that the kids drew, don't we? These are pretty good. Look at this one with a big old long beard. Very wise. And here's a blue-eyed God. <laughs> These are pretty good, actually. Some people imagine Jesus as being very loving and God as being very strict, full of rage and unforgiving. Now some people even debate saying that it was Jesus' idea to come and save the world because Jesus loved the world so much. And they do not believe that God made that decision because God was so strict so that Jesus himself was the one who decided to come. However, in Matthew, we read that that's not true, that Jesus came to die for our sins, and that whole idea started with God. That's uh, in John 3.16, you'll see that later. So it was God who actually sent his son because God loved people so much. And he wanted us to explore the scriptures together. And we'll do that this morning. So John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. 
I don't know if you remember this Old Testament story. I've talked on it before, but it's from Numbers chapter 21. Do you remember the Israelites were leaving Egypt and they were out in the desert traveling through the wilderness and they were getting very, very critical of each other and they were full of complaints, they were angry and God sent a poisonous snake into the camp slithering right through their tents and it, and it would bite people and die for punishment. The people immediately began to repent and beg for mercy because they didn't want to be killed by the snake. So God told Moses to make a picture of the snake and put it on a pole, let the snake um, wind down the pole so that people could see it and believe and that they would be healed. So they would um, realize if, if they looked at the snake straight on, they could be healed and not die from it. And that was interesting. So that story was passed down to the Israelites for many, many years. In fact, even King Hezekiah thought that the, worship, that the uh, Jewish people were worshiping the snake and that the snake, had, that idol of the snake, had saved their lives. And that puzzled scholars because they thought, you know, Moses made this snake, but we've been forbidden to construct idols or worship idols. So the rabbis said, the people knew that the snake did not save them. They knew that it was just a visual symbol that they could see and be reminded that God was in control and that God decided who would never die. So they were not in actuality worshiping an idol. idol. It was just a visual way to remind them that God saved and God alone decides when we live and when we die. However, in the whole test, Old Testament in Hezekiah, the snake had to be destroyed because the Jews had started to actually morph into worshiping the snake. And that's how idolatry became a little more widespread. They were thinking that the idol actually had power, but it didn't. You know, nothing that we have as a visual representation has power. It's only God who has the power. These accoutrements are just to lead us to look to God. You know, they were actually not worshiping the snake. They were worshiping God. The snake was just a symbol. And Jesus said that it is the same with me. When the time comes, the Son of Man must be lifted up so that those who look on me will believe and be saved. Now, Jesus had a double meaning in this. He would be lifted up on the cross, and also he would be lifted up into heaven, meaning that Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension were symbols of forgiveness and salvation. So our job is to remind ourselves that Jesus is real, that Jesus truly died for our sins and believe. You know, and that belief part is not easy for lots of people. They hear the story of Jesus, but it's hard for them to believe. So our job is to help, to believe without wavering, and to believe without doubting or questioning all the time. Now in verse 16, John 3.16 says, This is the most famous verse in the entire Bible, right? The most well-known. They even have a name for it. It's called the Everybody's Text. That's what this is known as. The Everybody's Text. Because this is the verse that people can memorize. Other verses people can't retain, but this one everybody can memorize. So sign it with me, please. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Ah, oh, amen and amen. So that's an easy one for us to memorize, because we have to remember from this, we remember how wide and vast God's love is. This can help all of us understand who God loves, this can help us remember who God loves. And it shows us how wide God's love is, 
This says, God so loved, who did he love? The world. Thank you, Jesus. God loved the entire world. Not one group of people, not just the Jewish folks. God loved the world. He didn't only love the good people. God does not only love a particular race or those of particular financial statuses or a particular number of folks. God does not love only people who follow God. God loves people who are hard to love. God loves people who have horrible, terrible behavior. God loves people who are depressed, who are lonely, who are ill. God loves people who love him, and God loves people who don't love God. God loves people who accept God's love immediately, and God loves people who reject God's love. God loves the world, and God will not rest until every individual is aware of the gospel, hears the gospel, sees the gospel, understands the gospel, and accepts God. God will continue until that happens and then rest. Now in verse 17, it reads, verses 17 and 18, say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So what in the world does that mean? Sounds like a paradox, right? God is love, God loves the world, and here God's judging. Sounds like a, a complete contradiction. God sent love into the world, or did God send condemnation into the world? Well, this is where I really need all of you and me to understand our responsibility with judging and condemnation. This is absolutely not about God being angry. That is not the purpose of this. This is about God's love, not God's anger. A lot of people read a verse like this and misunderstand it. If you believe in Jesus, great. If you don't, you're going to hell. You're going to eternal punishment and pain for eternity. That's what people read into this when they read this type of verse. But this is not about God's anger. It is about God's love. God never changes. Never changes. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Now, if a person is offered the gift of salvation and new life, a new lifestyle, and if that person receives that gift with thanks, then that person is saved and changed, truly changed. That if you accept salvation and you are changed, that's you're given a repentant heart, and that's what changes people. Now, if a person is offered the gift of salvation and that person rejects it, that is the person's respond to the gift. Then they receive punishment. That is the individual's response to the gift. Now you can say, Jesus is our Messiah, Jesus has come to save you, you can show the verses, and if a person says, no, sorry, I'm rejecting Jesus, that is their personal decision, it's their action, it's their attitude that receives the consequences. It's not that God becomes angry and wants to punish them. It's our decision. Our decision determines which consequence we receive. Our decision determines which consequence we want. Because God sent his son Jesus into the world as a gift from God. And if people rejected God's love, then the people brought punishment onto themselves 
through that rejection. Does that make sense to you? It's not God getting mad and shooting down fire and brimstone. It's all of our individual choices, whether to accept Jesus or not. So it's your response, your action, your decision that determines your eternal life. Does that make sense to y'all? Because God is love. God cherishes you. He wants every single one in the world to be at home in heaven. God wants you to accept, his, to accept God's gift. That's what God wants. Now we make the decisions. You know, we have free will. We can decide to be nice today. We can decide to be mean today. We can decide to serve today. We can decide not to serve today. We can decide to love God today. We can decide not to love God today. We have free will. We can decide what we want. And each decision we make has a consequence. And it's all a consequence in happening due to our behavior. God is only presenting the gift. We can take it and have great consequences, or we can choose not to accept the gift and the consequences is not good. Amen? Well, on the next verses, 19 through 21 say, the next verses say, and this is beautiful, Says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. That is so true. This applies to all of us. So everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that they be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. I love that. It's so true. It is just so true, right? So, people who do bad things or do evil things, people who lie or cheat or steal or commit adultery, you know, there's lots and lots of bad things that people do, you know? There's lots of things that we could choose to do bad. And I am guilty and you're guilty, right? We are not angelic every day, all day. That may be our desire. We want to improve. And we should improve. We really should see some improvement in ourselves every day and every week and every month and every year. You've got to see improvement. But it's not a straight shot upward. It's up and back and up and back. The point is we need to keep working until we arrive at our true home. And that's what we have to do. You know, we have some mistakes that we make. I make plenty of them, plenty of mistakes. We make mistakes that we don't want other people to see, right? We don't want that light. You know, Jesus' light is pure. It's beautiful. It's truth. It's integrity. It's honesty. It's love. There is no sin in him at all. And if we have made lots of mistakes or errors, we don't want people to see us. And that light will show exactly what we've done. So we tend to hide and run from it. And people said, and the scripture says people did that because they loved their deeds that were evil. They wanted to stay the way they were. They didn't want to grow. Some people don't want to improve. They say, oh, I will, I will, I want, I want, but they don't. And once the light comes, they maybe dip their toe into it and then flee. Because the light is all goodness. Jesus' light is contained right here. This contains Jesus' light. And in the church on Sunday mornings, we see the light. We can come and bask in the light and be 
joy, filled with joy, because God has shown us what we need to change, what we need to improve in our lives. God shows this to us. And that's why we come here. We sit and we pray to the Lord, help my mind be open, help my heart be open, help my spirit be open to receive your message. What is it you need to tell me? What do I need to change? I am just ready to be in your life and happy to be standing under your spotlight. I know what I need to do better. Show me what I need. What I need to stop, let me have that illuminated so that I can follow what you want. It's important, it's critical to remain in the light of Christ so that you can see what needs to be changed in your life. And that light can change you. Don't run from it. Because Satan will tempt you to run, to hide, to stay in the same old behavior, month after month, then year after year. Satan is a sly devil. Satan knows how to coerce. He knows how to make you feel like you are not supposed to be coming here. He knows how to make you feel like you are too busy for church. He knows how to make you feel that you can't read English well enough. He knows how to make you feel like you are worthless. Very, oh, Satan is very manipulative. Amen. You're right on the money there. Satan knows how and exactly what to say and what time to say it to, to entice you to run and hide. And any time you feel like you need to run and hide, just know that's a sign of the devil working in you. So if you come to the light, if you come in once a week, that's really not enough, but that's a great start. So come to the light and be bask in that light at least weekly. And God tells us what we need to do. People who flee, what happens to them? They begin to hate Jesus. That's the fact. They begin to hate Jesus. They will become judgmental and critical of the church, of the pastor, of the people of the time, you know, it starts, doesn't start on time, I am not going to that church, it starts late every week. Something's wrong with that church. <laughs> I am not going. And when you see those kind of words and those kind of actions, obviously they're hiding, they're hiding behind some kind of excuse. That pastor's too tall. <laughs> I am not going to that church anymore. Those people there are too young. I'm not going to that church anymore. I mean, those are dumb excuses, I agree. But when you see those kind of excuses, it means people are hiding. And pray for them. Invite them to come out of that darkness and come into the light. It can be very sad when you see people hiding like that. Very sad. And everyone makes mistakes. Of course, we all know that. But we all need to know what we've done wrong so that we can change. And God does not, did not only send Jesus here to offer us eternal light and forgiveness, but God sent Jesus here to be a light in our darkness, in our dark world, so that we can start to change many of the ugly things in the world. God's love means that we must submit to that godly spotlight and receive his, God's love. As we run and uh, if we run and hide, we will never know or experience God's love. And people who do that bring condemnation upon themselves. Because God's love is there. God's will all, God will always be love. There is no stronger love than His, than God's agape love. God has that love to offer us, and God will never stop making those offers. You can decide to say, no, thanks, God. I mean, that can be foolish. So I would encourage you to decide to accept God's love. And when you accept God's love, it means you are in God's light. If you reject God's love, you are choosing to stay in the darkness. So don't blame God for your mistakes. 
Just blame yourself. Blame yourself for rejecting, for drawing God without love. God is the artist of love. God is the artist of forgiveness continually. God has a heart of mercy and compassion. In Hebrew, we call him Abba, which means daddy. And in Hebrew, he is our Ima, which means our mother. Amen and amen. So let's play and pray together now. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love. We can't measure this love, and we can't even comprehend it. But when we feel like if we are in the darkness, help us to know that now is the time to leave and come back to your light and your love. Your love is so immense. It's unmeasurable. It's unlimited. You love all in the world. That's what your word tells us. Your word says that you love the world. Help us to love ourselves and help us to love our neighbors. Help us to love people everywhere. Help us to have forgiving hearts and to forgive readily. Help us to show your love, to show your light, to stay within your light for eternity until we are at home with you in heaven. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Our light, amen. Please stand for the final blessing. <laughs>